Hello, I'm Julian Stander and I'm going to talk today about Bayesian statistical inference. So I'm going to base my introduction to uh, Bayesian statistical inference on the simple linear regression model. And uh, to motivate this model, I'm going to consider data, bivariate data, data pairs, x, i, y, i, and I'm going to consider a sample size of n. And we could plot data such as this using a scatter plot. So any statistical package will allow you to do this. And, for example, this could be our data here. And uh, we could think that a straight line model could be a good model for those data. So uh, and for our purposes, the equation of a straight line is y equals beta naught plus beta 1x. And beta naught is the intercept. So that's where the line meets the x, uh, sorry, the y-axis at x equals naught. And um, beta 1 is the slope. And um, the simple linear regression model takes the form yi, so the ith data point, the y uh, value, is uh, beta naught plus beta 1 xi, so that's the straight line part, plus an error. We allow an error at each possible data point. Okay, so um, we have to make a, an assumption also about those errors, and the errors are assumed to be normally distributed uh, about zero with variance sigma squared. And we assume that they are independent. OK, now, if we uh, look at um, the equation for the y, we have here the uh, straight line that we've mentioned before. And, in fact, it can be shown that the expected value of yi, what we expect yi to be under the model, is exactly this straight line value. And that's because the expected value of epsilon i is 0. And that actually allows us to write the model in a, a different form. So here we had uh, our first way of expressing the model. And we can express this in a somewhat diff a different but equivalent way. Uh, yi follows a normal distribution with mean mu i and variance sigma squared, where the mu i is just the term above, which is beta naught plus beta 1 xi. Now, the advantage of writing the model in this equivalent form is that the first equation there is a, a purely deterministic equation. I'm sorry, the first equation is a purely random equation, or we can sometimes say it's stochastic, whilst the second equation there is deterministic. So we've split the model up in some sense into a random part and a non-random part. And that can be useful when uh, specifying these m models in the Bayesian framework. Um, so um, let me just say a little bit more about the interpretation uh, of this mu i and uh, about the sigma. So if we uh, concentrate now on just one data point, so for example that one there, if that's just xi, so there's xi, and uh, here's the value, yi, so that's yi there coming across, and here we have, uh, not very well drawn, but here we have the line, then the value on the line at xi is what we've called mu i, and our model is saying that potential y values are normally distributed about that mu i value. 
So a potential Y value could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be out in the tails, but much more rarely. And the spread of those potential Y values is controlled by sigma. So the higher value of sigma, the more spread out the data would be about that line. Well, what's unknown in all this setup are the parameters beta naught, beta 1 and sigma. And we want to learn about these from data. OK, and um, learning about these parameters from data is sometimes re referred to as perform inference. And if you've worked a, a, a little bit with R, you may know that there's a function in R which is called um, LM. And LM stands for Linear Model. And that will give you estimates of the parameters. And using another function, uh, it will also give you confidence intervals for them. And using yet another function, it will allow you to perform tests. Uh, so it will allow you to perform tests on beta naught and beta 1. Uh, it may be worth mentioning very quickly that the estimates that uh, LM gives you for beta naught and beta 1 for this intercept and the slope are maximum likelihood estimates. And there's a, a separate um, recording about maximum likelihood estimation. R uh, will also do predictions for you. Uh, so when we use the LM function uh, of R, we're working in the frequentist framework. And there are criticisms of the frequentist framework, uh, but I'm not going to talk about those uh, today because my aim is to talk about Bayesian inference. But um, uh, very briefly, uh, a, a possible criticism of the uh, frequentist framework comes when you think about the interpretation of confidence intervals. Interpretation of confidence intervals is based on a repeated sampling idea and in general, we don't have repeated samples. We just have the one sample. Um, so, um, as I said, our main interest today is to talk about Bayesian inference. And Bayesian inference is based on a mathematical object, which I'm going to write down now. So it, it looks a bit odd uh, when I'm first writing it, but I'm going to explain what it means. So this uh, bar here means given that or conditional upon. And what we have here is we have a probability density function. And this is the probability density function of the parameters that are unknown, so we're assuming they're random variables, given the data. And this object here is referred to as the posterior. Posterior probability density function, posterior distribution. It uh, expresses mathematically our belief about the parameters after seeing the data. Now, we can show uh, by using Bayes' theorem that the posterior probability density function is proportional to the likelihood, and I'll talk a little bit more about the likelihood soon, so the likelihood of beta naught, beta 1 and sigma multiplied by pi of beta naught, beta 1 and sigma. Now this pi of beta naught, beta 1, sigma is referred to as the uh, prior probability density function. 
and it's our belief about the parameters before seeing the data. This quantity here, the L function, is referred to as the likelihood, and there's another vis video about likelihoods. It's the likelihood or probability density function of the data given the parameters. And in fact, frequentist inference is based on that likelihood function. And that would be one of my criticisms of frequentist inference. It's based on the uh, probability density function of the data given the parameters. But in fact, in uh, reality, we're given the data and we want to learn about the parameters. So I would argue that the posterior uh, probability density function is a more natural one uh, with which to work when we do uh, um, um, statistical inference. OK, one of the criticisms of ba the Bayesian approach is that the prior probability density function has to be specified by the user. So we have to specify in some way what we believe about the parameters before seeing the data. And this can be quite difficult. Sometimes we might have uh, some good knowledge about the parameters uh, before seeing the data based on a previous study, a medical study, for example, but often we don't know very much about them. So what we tend to do is we tend to assume that before seeing the data, the uh, parameters are independent. So that uh, prior probability density function splits up into the product of three uh, uh, um, simple priors of each of um, the three parameters. So we separate out, uh, before seeing the data, the um, uh, parameters. And then we just need to specify the uh, prior dis probability density function for beta naught, for beta 1, and for sigma. OK, now how can we do that? Well, very often we just uh, assume prior ignorance. And what would this mean in the case of a beta naught? It would mean we take a essentially flat prior, so all values are equally likely. Well, in practice, this is done by assuming that the probability density function for beta naught is a normal distribution with a very high variance. And this means a whole range of values uh, are assumed more or less equally likely before seeing the data. You could say, well, why don't you just take a flat uh, probability density function? But if you had a flat probability density function going from minus infinity to infinity, for example, that would have under it area infinity, and that wouldn't, in fact, be a proper probability density function. So we take a normal uh, distribution with a very high variance to ensure that the underlying area is 1, and that makes it a proper probability density function. Then, when we see the data, that uh, prior probability density function would be updated into a posterior. And uh, the posterior here, I'm just going to concentrate on beta naught, uh, would be uh, much more concentrated. So here's the posterior. Um, after seeing the data, it could be much more concentrated on a, a particular range of values. So what we've done is we've said essentially all possible values are equally likely, that's prior ignorance, to a small range of values are now likely, and that would be our prior, our posterior knowledge. And mathematically, the data come in by means of the likelihood function there.
So I think that uh, um, summarises, in, in some sense, the Bayesian approach to inference. We have a, a prior uh, uh, knowledge about our parameters that can express a, a great ignorance about them, but then data uh, are, are supplied, data are given, and that prior knowledge is then updated into a posterior knowledge that's much more concentrated. So, um, as before, inference is based on the posterior. So, I'll just write down the posterior again. And we saw before that the posterior is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. And that follows from Bayesian. Now, because uh, we have a proportionality sign there, well, we know that a proportionality sign can be replaced by an equals times a constant. But unfortunately, in Bayesian inference, this constant is very often very hard, if not impossible, to find mathematically. So this means that the a posterior probability density function cannot be dealt with uh, in a mathematical way but in fact it has to be uh, understood in a different way and that is by simulation. So the idea would be the following that uh, we'd take the um, um, posterior probability density function. Now I'm going to draw this now in two dimensions. I only have uh, two dimensions in which I can work. So I'm actually going to draw here a contour plot of the uh, posterior for beta naught and beta 1 only. So these could potentially be the contours. These are lines of equal probability density for um, the density function that I'm writing now. And the idea uh, would be that instead of uh, struggling to find that mathematically, which might in some cases be impossible, we actually simulate points from that uh, um, probability density. Obviously, there are a lot more points in the centre because we're going uphill in this picture than there are uh, around the outside. So we get very few points out here, but we want to simulate a lot of points there. And those simulated points can be used to approximate features of that uh, um, posterior. So, for example, if we took the sample mean of all the simulated beta naught values, that would be an approximate um, approximation to the posterior mean of a beta naught given the data. So that would be a summary of the posterior distribution. We'll meet that again shortly. So how could this sampling be done? Well, there's a number of algorithms, but a very popular algorithm to sample from a posterior distribution is the Gibbs sampler. And the Gibbs sampler is an example of a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. And at Plymouth, on the Plymouth courses about Bayesian statistics, we sample from the uh, posterior distribution using a code called JAGS, using a program called JAGS, which stands for just another Gibbs sampler. And JAGS is one of many possible sampling engines, uh, but it's the one at Plymouth we use uh, at the moment. And we would code our model up, we would specify our model for the computer using a language called BUGS, which stands for uh, Bayesian Analysis Using Gibbs Sampling. If we want to work in R, then there's a package called R2JAGS, which links the JAGS code to R. And we can supply code and examples of this if you just drop us a note. So 
Um, once we can sample from this uh, posterior distribution, we can summarise uh, our posterior distribution, as I've already suggested, using quantities like the uh, posterior mean, which uh, for beta 1 would be, uh, sorry, for beta naught would be what I've just written above. Uh, we could uh, summarise using the posterior median, which takes this form. Sorry, I've got that wrong. That should be a beta naught and that should be a median there. So apologies for that error. And these two quantities here, the posterior mean and the posterior median, are are good one number decisions about beta naught. So if somebody said to you, give me one number that uh, expresses our belief about beta naught after seeing the data, it would be that value there, the expected value. And you could use the median as well. But you might actually want to have a, a range of values, an interval estimate for beta naught, and that can be uh, provided by means of a credible interval. And unlike confidence intervals, credible intervals are, um, uh, have a probabilistic interpretation. So say that we had a credible interval which was uh, 5 to 6, then the associated probability statement would be the probability that 5 is less than beta naught is less than 6, given the data is equal to 0 0.95 in the case of a 95% credible interval. So that's an exact probability statement, uh, which is different from uh, the um, repeated sampling interpretation of a confidence interval. So uh, that is how we would use our sample uh, from the uh, posterior distribution to summarise the posterior distribution. We could present the, uh, um, the posterior mean, the posterior median, and a credible interval, usually a 95% credible interval. Um, it's worth mentioning briefly that in Bayesian statistics, um, it's more often... Um, used uh, as parameterization uh, at TOR, which is sometimes called precision, rather than uh, sigma, which is standard deviation. Now there's a relationship between TOR and sigma, so TOR equals 1 over sigma squared, in other words, 1 over the variance, and so this means that when you have high variance, so when the uh, data points are scattered a lot about the straight line, you have low precision, and that makes sense. And similarly, when you have low variance, you have high precision. And that doesn't matter. All it means is that in practice, everything that I wrote above, instead of sigma, we replace sigma with tor, where tor is 1 over sigma, we perform our inference about tor, and then we can perform inference about sigma in a very simple way, because sigma is 1 over the square root of tor. So that's in, in a sense in detail, uh, but it's just to mention that very often you'll see Bayesian models uh, parameterized by precision and not by standard deviation or variance. So that is, uh, in a way, the end of the coverage of the uh, work on Bayesian uh, inference. I've presented a, a, the simple linear regression model and I hope to have explained how we can perform inference about the parameters of the simple linear regression model uh, using uh, in the Bayesian framework using this idea that we can sample from the posterior distribution where the posterior is our belief about the parameters after seeing the data. The uh, last uh, part of this presentation is going to be a bit more technical and it's going to discuss the Gibbs sampler itself, how we can actually sample from the uh, posterior distribution.
So to illustrate the Gibbs sampler, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the same picture as I drawn before. So we really want to sample from the um, uh, posterior distribution of beta naught, beta one, and sigma. But unfortunately, I only have uh, two dimensions to work with on the um, um, on this. Uh, tablet here. So I'm going to uh, just work with beta naught and beta 1 and we've seen this picture before and these here are contours, uh, lines of equal probability density of uh, the posterior of beta naught, beta 1 given the data. And what we've said before is we want to sample according to this posterior distribution. So we want more points sampled in the um, inner part of it than in the outer part of it, because this is an uphill distribution. So how do we actually do this sampling? Well, we use the Gibbs sampler, and it works as follows. The user specifies an initial value of beta 1, which we're going to call beta 1 with the superscript 0. The algorithm then cuts the probability density function in the beta naught direction. So if you cut a hill, you get a hill, and you effectively get a uh, hill coming out of the paper that looks something like that. And then um, the Gibbs sampler samples from that, in this case, one-dimensional hill. So maybe this is a sampled value. The blue value there is the sampled value. That would be our first sampled value of beta naught. So I'm going to call that beta naught 1. And then the algorithm proceeds in the direction of beta 1. So we cut the, the um, two-dimensional uh, probability density function in the beta 1 direction. That yields a hill. So I'm going to draw that now in green. It looks something like that. I then sample a value of beta 1 according to that probability density function. So that could be something like this here, beta 1, 1. I then extend that like this. Then I cut, uh, then I cut there and sample from that distribution. And that gives me a new value of beta naught. And I carry on like that. So these cuts here that I, I've mentioned are in fact conditional distributions. And why does this process work? Why does it allow us to sample from that distribution when we cannot do the mathematics? Well, what we're actually doing is we're reducing a two-dimensional sampling problem is actually being divided uh, into two one-dimensional sampling problems. And indeed, in, in reality here, we've got a three-dimensional sampling problem because we've got beta naught, beta one, and sigma, and that's divided into three. One, sorry, three uh, one-dimensional sampling problems. So we, it's a divide and conquer type algorithm. We we have a, a very high-dimensional distribution into which we from which we want to sample, and we reduce that sampling problem down to simpler one-dimensional sampling problems. So we've uh, seen that uh, if we uh, repeat this process. we would end up with a, a sample such as b, uh, beta um, 1 naught, beta 1 1, beta 1 2, and so on. And, of course, we also get out the same thing for beta naught and for sigma, or for tor, whatever we're using. And uh, the whole of this is actually a, a Markov chain. And why is it a Markov chain? Because uh, each value depends on the previous value. So that makes it like a chain. 
And in fact, it's a Markov chain which has an equilibrium or stationary distribution that is the uh, posterior distribution that we're interested in. In practice, what we do for each of the parameters of our model is we produce a plot like this. So I'm only going to do it for beta uh, 1 here. So here's beta 1j against j, iteration j. So at uh, first iteration, we'd have beta 1 naught, And then we'd monitor the values that we sample. And at a certain point, that plot uh, would settle down. So imagine you also have a similar plot for beta naught and for sigma or for tau. And the features of this plot are that uh, we have an initial phase which is called a transient phase, which is sometimes referred to as a burn-in. And then we have a, a settle-down phase, and that's referred to as the ergodic phase. And as I said, we've got the same thing going on for the other chains. And values from here, from the ergodic phase, are a dependent sample from the posterior. Now, why is it dependent? Well, it's all based on the Markov chain, where we have a dependency with, a, for example, there, beta 1, 2, depending on beta 1, 1. So there is a dependency of a value on its previous value. Uh, so we don't get an independent sample from the posterior, but we do get a, a, a sample. And um, so uh, pictures like this are used to decide uh, when, it, if you like, the memory of the value that you've chosen to start the algorithm going, sometimes JEGS will do that automatically for you, but when the, va va then the, the memory of the initial value fades away and you're just sampling from the posterior distribution. Now, the Gibbs sampler is a very general uh, and generally used algorithm uh, to sample from a, a multivariate posterior distribution. It sometimes converges quite slowly to the distribution if, for example, the contours uh, contour plot was very thin, uh, narrow and thin, um, then you get slow convergence. But in general, for a very broad range of models, the Gibbs sampler is an excellent sampling tool. Um, and that's why it's been implemented in packages such as JEGS. So uh, thank you very much. Um, that was just a, a brief overview of how the Gibbs sampler works. The Gibbs sampler is the main computational tool for sampling from the posterior distribution, which is the distribution of the parameters of the model given the data on which our inference is based in the, it is based in the Bayesian framework. I hope you have found this useful. Thank you very much.